Hi family, thank you for joining us online today. It is our honor to be able to come to your homes, your office, or wherever you may be watching us here today. When you are able, we would love for you to come and join us physically in our Sunday celebration. We meet Sundays, 3.30 p.m. at 55 Devere Drive, Guelph, Ontario. We hope today's message will encourage you in your walk with the Lord, build you up in your faith, and empower you to live the victorious life that Jesus Christ paid for on the cross. Here's today's message. But we're continuing on with our Kingdom Life series that we have uh, started last week. I want to encourage you. It was a very important message that I shared last week. I want to encourage you, if you have not yet heard it, I want, I want to encourage you. It's on YouTube. It's on our Facebook channel or Facebook page. I want, I want you to go and listen to that because that really establishes our framework of everything we, we know and everything we read in Scripture that will help make everything else connect and make sense when we get into our Word. And so... I want to encourage you to do that. So today I want to do a second part and Kingdom Life series part two. Uh, and I've entitled this serving okay, with a subtitle, The Great Ones Work. In, t in line with what we are doing today, where we are going to be opening up uh, you know, a ministry launch and people will be able to, to, to serve and, and sign up. I want to just make sure that we're able to encourage those that are going to be doing that. And I want to let you know ahead of time that in the kingdom, greatness is serving. In the kingdom, greatness is serving. We're going to take a text today. You do have your outlines with you in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 to 28. Scripture says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. Then the ten heard about this, and they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave just as the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many let us pray father as we go to your word today we thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us lord today right under this beautiful heavens this beautiful clouds that you've given us lord we look up to you today and we're just so thankful that we can come together as brothers and sisters to worship you to gather around your word to receive from your word today to be encouraged and to be edified by your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that is here among us now. I thank you for the, for, the, for the fellowship and the gathering of the brethren together here. In Jesus' name, amen. I mentioned earlier that in the kingdom of God, greatness is serving. In the context that we read, James and his brother, John, had decided, had seen an opportunity um, that the other 10 disciples were wishing they were the ones to see it. They had the opportunity. They saw the opportunity and took advantage of actually bringing their mom along with them and asking Jesus if they can both sit at the right hand and on the left hand of Jesus when his kingdom is established. Again, I want to bring back the point that everything we talk about in Scripture is always within the framework of the kingdom of God. And so there's this, there's, there's an, the word says that there's, they were indignant. They were very upset at the two brothers. The ten were very angry at the two brothers because of the request that they brought before Jesus. And the reason why, in my imagination, the reason why uh, they were so upset with them was because they themselves had been wanting to ask the same thing. And the two beat them to the punch. So they were upset, not because it was a wrong question. They were upset because they wanted to be the ones to ask that question. You know, it's kind of like for us, in our culture, when there's only one piece of, you know, one piece of donut or so left in the box, nobody will touch it. 
you know, it's our it's our culture thing where it's like there's only one left and uh, you really want it but you won't right and in the same way the 10 were wanting this so bad but they couldn't pull the trigger and they got beat to the punch and they were upset there was this desire in them and in the in the two there there was a desire an inner desire within the 12 for greatness and and i would just want to make sure that we understand this correctly because this desire for greatness is inherent in every single human being that ever came to the earth you know this by looking at your children no one is ever born wanting to become mediocre Nobody plans out their life to become mediocre. I just want to be okay in life. I just want to be okay in what I do. I just want to be an okay individual. Everybody growing up wants to be great. Everybody wants to be a superhero. Every child growing up wants to be a superhero. And this desire for greatness is within sight of each one of us. And this desire for greatness began to manifest in the disciples. Why? Because when you are around great people, you want to be great. And they've been around Jesus now for some time. And this just stirred up inside of them. You know, when you see somebody great, you want to become like them. Especially when it's people, especially when it's people that are showing their gifts that is similar to what you have. For those who love basketball, when you see a great player, you want to emulate them. You want to become just like them. Why? Because you love basketball. There's something in you that loves that sport. In the same way, the disciples have been around Jesus and they wanted to be great. But the problem was that they misunderstood what greatness was and what its purpose was. And so Jesus comes and he, 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 he takes them and teaches them. Now, in, in the other Gospels, it speaks, it talks about how the disciples were arguing about who the greatest was. They were arguing amongst themselves. Of course, they wouldn't say that when Jesus was around, but they would argue amongst themselves as to who was greater. Not only do they do it once, but in the book of Luke, there's actually two accounts, different accounts, where they were actually... Now, think about it. These are the disciples. These are the apostles. And there was so much pride and so much of this comp competition as to who was greater among them. And Jesus comes and brings them brings them aside not to destroy the desire to be great but to realign it to kingdom purpose as to what greatness is in the kingdom of god so their desire was not discouraged but rather jesus took the time and taught them what greatness was so what does greatness look like in the kingdom of god greatness looks like servanthood greatness looks like servanthood and jesus modeled it to them when he begins when he was asked by by the by the two boys's mom his reply was what is it that you want what is it that you want when the blind beggar came to him he had asked to he had asked the blind beggar what is it that you want me to do for you jesus already exemplified this now remember he was king of kings and lord of lords but yet he comes with a heart to serve. And he asks the blind beggar, what is it that you want me to do for you? When John and Andrew started to follow Jesus, his question to them was, what is it that you want me to do? With a lame man at the well, he, he asked them, do you want to be made well? Jesus was in it to serve those that were around him. So greatness in the kingdom looks like an apron and not a cape. In the kingdom, the great ones served. In, in, the, sorry, in the world, the great ones served. Sorry, let me, I can't see what I'm reading right now. It's too dark. Sorry. In the world, let me get this straight. In the world, the great ones are served. In the kingdom, the great ones do the serving. In the world, leaders are served. In the kingdom, leaders serve. That's why you will see all our ministry heads in this church be the first ones to get here. Or supposed to get here. They always get here first. And they always stay late. First to come, last to go. Why? Because they understand the principle of servant leadership. They understand that they exist. Their lives are there to, to serve the church. 
They understand that they represent a kingdom and a king that is of another world. In the world, the men of great stature let others do all the work. In the kingdom, the great ones work. In the world, oftentimes it is only those who have connections, the right last name, ones with power, ones with money, that can become great. In the kingdom of God, anyone can become great because everyone can serve. So Jesus realigns their idea of what greatness looked like. That's why in verse 26, he says, not so with you. The rulers of this world, they rule over, they have dominion, they dominate people. They hold it over those that are under them. He says, not so with you. You exist to serve. You exist to give your life. Jesus was also teaching them the purpose for greatness. The purpose for greatness is not to have dominion over people. In Matthew 20, verse 25 to 27, he says, But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the, world, of the world lord it over people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. Greatness, and this is what I, I really want us to understand this, as kingdom citizens, as followers of Christ, your great, the greatness, position, your authority does not, is not to stand over people to hold them down where they're at. Our authority, our positions, our you know, our influence is used to come under people to lift them up to where God has called them to be. That is the purpose for authority in the kingdom of God. That is the purpose for leadership in the kingdom of God. We come alongside, we, we, we submit ourselves under to serve those that are, are among us, to lift them up, to become somebody that they could not have been otherwise. Team leaders, how do we apply this? Team leaders, you exist not to keep people under you forever. As team leaders, our, 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 our heart is to equip those that are in our teams, the members of our teams, so that they will know everything that we know and that they will one day take the job that we have. That's our purpose. In the world, if you're a team leader, you're a manager, you keep everybody down. You want to make sure that you know something that they don't because you find your value in what you know. You find your value in, in, in that's how you are able to keep yourself safe from being replaced. In the kingdom, leaders come under to serve those that are under them so that those who are under them can be lifted up. Our bosses and our managers... We're always teaching and training and mentoring so that one day they can become what you are today. That's the purpose of why God elevated you. For those of you that are team leads, that are, that are higher up in positions at work, that's the purpose of why God brought you there so that those who are under you, the favor of God on your life is meant to influence and affect those that are under you. You use the favor that God has placed in your life to bring others and elevate their life to be where yours is at. And if you are faithful with that, God will take care of you and bring you higher. So we want to bring, I want to come back to the context of where we are today, serving within the church. Man, I get to preach and work on my tan too. <laughs> this will help, this will help shorten the message, won't it? <laughs> You're all thinking, yeah, we should do this more often then. <laughs> Serving in the church. I want to make this statement. Serving, especially in the context of the local church, is one of the greatest joys as kingdom citizens. It is where we can tangibly serve God by serving His house and serving His people. It is one of the greatest joys you and I will ever have on this side of eternity. We serve all the time. We go tomorrow morning. Some of you tonight, you'll be going serving somewhere. You'll be serving at work. You'll be serving your bosses, your companies, your managers. And what do we get in return? Monetary gain, which is here today, gone by Tuesday. 
but in the kingdom. That's why the book of Hebrews says, Do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap a harvest. Everything we do, especially when we are serving one another, the house of the Lord, the people of God, there, God is taking account. There, is, there are rewards awaiting for us in heaven. Now, we're not doing it for the rewards, but I just want to let you know, when you grow weary of doing things, think about the rewards. Three reasons why we serve in the house. Number one, we reflect the character of Jesus. Matthew 20, 28, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. We have been called followers of Christ, and as such, we need to follow the character of Christ. In fact, Jesus not only challenged us to be servants, but to actually lay down our lives for others. I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And every time we serve, in a sense, we are laying a very, very, very small portion of our lives for others. When we come a little earlier and stay a little later because we're serving that day, we're laying down a little bit of our lives. When we clean up the mess that is not ours, we are giving of ourselves. When we serve the food first, our banquet team, when they serve the food first and they eat last, if there's ever anything left, you are giving and dying to yourself. When you have to handle children that are not yours, you know you're going to die, right? <laughs> you, you, you know you're, give, you're probably giving more than, you know. When you are handling, like I was just watching in their homes, children in their homes, running all this energy. It's like little tornadoes just everywhere. And I'm watching, and I'm getting tired just watching. And yet they do it in their homes. They did it for three straight days. They do it Sunday after Sunday. There are some who do it for a living. God bless them. That's probably why they don't serve in the Sea Kids ministry when they come to church. I can understand. <laughs> Want to keep their sanity. That's, that's okay. So when we give of ourselves, we are dying in a certain way. We are giving of ourselves in a little way. When you come to practice as a worship team, when everyone else is enjoying the sunshine in the summer, you're giving of yourself. Not for yourself, but for the benefit of everybody that comes on Sunday so that they are able to be blessed and not be distracted. They're able to worship and not be grieved. So they come and they give of themselves Thursday night after Thursday night so that they can be a blessing to others. We have our sound team that come and make sure that the pastor sounds good on the mic better than he actually does in person. Or our stream team that makes the pastor look better than he actually does. <laughs> and all, all the filters they have to use and editing and all of these things. They are giving of themselves. But these are all very, very small ways that we're able to lay down our lives for the sake of others. S Hebrews 6.10, For he is, God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for others, caring for other believers as you still do. God will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by serving his body, serving his people. Number two, number, second reason why we serve in the house. Number two, we put carnality to death. We put carnality to death. Our selfishness, our, about me, myself, and I, in a culture where it is a me-centered culture, where the focus is all about me, What's in it for me? What will you do for me? Will you preach a feel-good message for 
me? Will you sing my favorite song for me? Where consumerism has crept into the church. We've, this is how we deal with that. We die to ourselves. We give of ourselves because consumerism is about me. What can you do for me? Will you sing my favorite songs? If you do, I'm, I'm going to go to the church that will sing my favorite most requested songs. Will you preach feel-good messages only? And don't ever talk about sin. Don't ever address these issues in my life. It's consumerism. We put it to death by giving of ourselves. Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. You see, the first kingdom colony, the first church in the book of Acts, did not have a me-centered, consumeristic approach to church. Instead of what's in it for me, they had, here's what I have to contribute to the church mentality. Instead of having a, what can you do for me? They had a, what can I do to help attitude? Instead of what can I get? They asked, what do you need? Acts chapter 2, 44, 45, Passion Translation puts it this way. All the believers were in fellowship as one body and they shared with one another whatever they had. Out of generosity, they sold, they even sold their assets to distribute to those to distribute distribute the proceeds to those who were in need among them. Ch listen, folks, church, those that are here and those who are online, the DNA of the church, the DNA of the body of Christ, its very inception is one who is self-giving is one that is generous, is one that considers others, according to Scripture, considers others as better than themselves. The very DNA of the church of Jesus Christ is the very DNA of Jesus who said, I am giving myself as a ransom for many. That, my friends, is the very foundation of who we are. We are a selfless people, not a selfish people. We, are, we give of ourselves. Why? Because that is the very nature of Jesus himself. If that is what he modeled to us, then that is who we are called to be. And that's why we cannot give in to this poverty mentality. I don't have anything to give. You do. But when, you, when, when it's all about you, you will never have enough. But when you understand that you exist to give of yourself, that God has placed something inside of you that not only the church needs, but the world needs, then you will discover many things about you that you never thought you had. Gifts and callings and generosity and, and all of these anointings, you will discover those things. Why? Because your mindset has shifted from what can I get to what is in it for me to give. We serve, when we serve others, truly serve others, the last thing in our minds is ourselves. It is no longer our own preferences and likes and dislikes. It is what is good for the whole. It is what is good for others. Lastly, are you guys okay? All right. Lastly, we are needed in the church. We serve in the house because we are needed in the house. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12. This is a very familiar passage for us and one that we focus in more than the others. It talks about how God is, let me just read it to you. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Our role as pastors, evangelists, teachers, apostles, and prophets is to equip the church to do the work of ministry. That verse is very familiar to us. And therefore, we, because of a wrong mindset, we elevate those offices and those people and the people who, who function in those offices and say, well, let them do all the work. I'm just a member. I'm just coming to receive. Not realizing that we actually have something in us 
that God is expecting us to contribute to the work of the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 to 28. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you a part of it. Here, here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First, our apostles. Second, our prophets. Third, our teachers. Then those who do miracles. Those who have the gifts of healing. Those who can help others. Those who have the gift of leadership. Those who speak in unknown languages. Isn't that interesting? We have the big titles. Apostles, prophets, evangelists. But Paul says, in the same way that God used and placed those people in the church, I have placed people with a ministry of helps. Let me ask you a question. Do you know how to help? You guys are looking at me like, this is a trick question. What's he asking me to help him with? I'm not going to ask you to help me preach. <laughs> okay, so you can relax. But can you help? Can you help lifting a table? Can you help with any, you know, can you help in any way whatsoever? We all can help. That is a gift that God has placed in people so that he can use that for his kingdom. So we cannot say, well, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, yes, those are great. I just know how to help. I know how to put sanitizer bottles in the bathrooms. That's all. That's all. You have to realize that when Paul writes all these gifts down, he does not write them down by importance. Every gift that God gives is just as important as the rest. There is not one that is superior than, and one is inferior. We are all called to something. And every gift that God has placed in his body is needed in his body for his body to function properly. Each of us has been given a gift by God for the purpose of strengthening and completing the body of Christ. We are incomplete and weaker without your contribution. I want to say that again. We are incomplete and we are weaker without your contribution. There is something about you. There is something that is in you that when you bring it to, to the table, it causes the church to become more complete and stronger. We need you, we need people to help fulfill the mission of the church. We need each one to help fulfill the mission of the church. I will close with this. The last lesson Jesus modeled to the disciples is found in John chapter 13, right before the Last Supper. In that chapter, Jesus, uh, before the communion, before he institutes communion, he, he, he gathers his friends around. They're having dinner. And he gets up and he takes an apron. He takes off his robe and he puts on an apron and fills a basin uh, uh, full of water. And he begins to wash his disciples' feet. And when he gets to Peter in John 13, verse 6 to 18, he says, But when Jesus got to Simon Peter, he objected and said, I can't let you wash my dirty feet. You're my Lord. Jesus replied, You don't understand yet the meaning of what I'm doing, but soon it will be clear to you. Peter looked at Jesus and said, You'll never wash my dirty feet. Never. But Peter, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, Jesus responded, then you will not be able to share life with me. Peter walked with Jesus for three years up to this point, and he still didn't understand the principle of those who are called to greatness must learn to serve. It was so opposite of what Peter grew up understanding. Peter's understanding was that those who are great are the ones to be served. And Jesus had to actually model it to them. Jesus didn't just teach it. It was such a powerful principle and such a hard principle to understand that he had to actually show them how to do it. Because unless they saw him do it, it would have been very hard for them to believe it. That those who are great in the kingdom of God 
must learn to serve. He had been taught the opposite to what it was. What Jesus showed him was the opposite to what he had been taught and grown up and, and, uh, and lived growing up. That the great ones serve. That serving doesn't diminish you. Serving lifts and empowers others to become who they are and where they should be. And Jesus closes that portion off by saying, So now put into practice what I have done for you, and you will experience a life of happiness enriched with untold blessings. So we're not just following Jesus for the teaching. We follow the lifestyle that Jesus modeled. And Jesus modeled a lifestyle of serving those who were with him, those who were under him, so that those who were under him could be elevated to where he was. And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you must learn to do the same thing. Serve one another. Serve with your gifts. The greatest leaders we could think of right now, whose name are synonymous for greatness. If I say Michael Jordan, that's a great leader. You can't win many championships not being a great leader. You think of Michael Jackson. That's a great pop. He's a king of pop. Michael Jordan would be the king of the basketball court. You see, what they did was they found their gift, they honed their gift, and they served the world with their gift. What is the gift that God has placed in you? What has God placed in us that we can say, here is my gift. I want to contribute to the kingdom of God. They became leaders because they served the people with a gift that they had. In the same way, you and I are called to serve one another with whatever gifts you and I may have. And so I want to encourage all of us today. We share this, I share this, not just because it's ministry launched Sunday. But if you take this principle and serve your workplace, if you take this principle and you, work, you, you serve your bosses, not for monetary gain, not for what you can get out of it, but with a true heart to serve your company, true heart to serve the vision of, your, of, of wherever you're working, if you take that heart to truly serve, not for what you can get out of it, you will be noticed above everybody else. Because people will notice when people are serving out of a heart to truly serve and people that are in it just for what they can get out of it. So be great servants. Be great servants. Tomorrow morning, go serve your companies excellently. When you go to work tonight, go serve your team leaders. Go serve your bosses excellently. Why? Because they're going to see the kingdom of God in you. And the Bible says that they will give glory to God. That becomes your platform and your opportunity to, be, to not only be the gospel, but to share the gospel. Why? Because they're going to see something different in you. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the model that you've given us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus, you were king. You were God. But yet you came not to be served, but to serve and give your life for others. And you have called us to the same. You've called us not for our own and what we can get out of things, but you've called us to give of ourselves for the sake of being your follower. And so, Lord, today we pray that tomorrow, even tonight, as some of your children go to work, that they would serve with excellence, with a heart of servant, so that, Father, they would, the people that are around them would see the difference and that they would, they would experience a factor of heaven among them. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We're going to close. I forgot we're going to close for our on online folks. Let's just pray again. Lord Jesus, we bless those ones that are watching here online. Father, we've not forgotten them and neither have you. 
where they're at. I pray for your presence, your joy, your peace, your wholeness to be upon each household. I pray, Father, for every need to be provided for according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And today we bless all these ones that are watching us online until we see each other again. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Go with God as God goes with you. Thank you so much for joining us online today. If this message has impacted you or has blessed you in any way, would you consider sharing it on your social media platforms? Perhaps God will use this same word to touch and bless your friends and your family's lives. And if you haven't, we encourage you to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel, all under Champion Life Center Guelph. By doing so, you get to stay updated with all our activities and the latest messages. Connect with us. We have online forms found in the description box below this video. We would love to hear from you. And if there's any way we can serve you or pray for you, that would be a great way to do it. If you also wish to partner with us in what God is doing through Champion Life Center Guelph, click on the link found in the description box and you will see various ways of partnering with our ministry. Until we see each other again, God bless you, go with God as God goes with you.